Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to ACRS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from Latvia, Dr. Kasper Oslens. Professor Oslens is an associate professor in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at the Riga Stadens University, Riga, Latvia. He is a member of the ENS as well as one of the faculties for the ENS Young Neurosurgeon courses. And he did his fellowships from the Royal Melbourne Hospital, Australia, and the Helsinki under Professor Yuha Harness near me. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today he will be talking about pros and cons of eyebrow approach. To speak for the second session of today's honored faculty from India, Dr. Vamsi Krishna Yaramneni. Professor Yaramneni is an associate professor and head of unit 2 at the Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad, India. He did his clinical fellowships in epilepsy and functional neurosurgery at the UDM Montreal, Canada. And he was also an observer fellow at the Seoul National University and Tel Aviv, Israel. We are extremely honored to have him today at webinars and today he will be talking about extended endoscopic endonasal approach for anterior and for some meningiomas. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Kentro Mori. Professor Mori is a professor of neurosurgery and chief of division of the cerebral stroke at the Tokyo General Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. He is an integral part of the ACNS delegation that conducts courses around the world. He is also a noted author who has published his enormous experience in eyebrow approach. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of CEO Kukato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chair and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this podium to our first chair, Professor Kentro Mori. Please, okay. please. Today, uh, we invited a famous uh, keyboard neurosurgeon, uh, Professor Kaspers Auslands from Latvia. Uh, he will uh, talk about the pros and cons of keyhole eyebrow skin, uh, eyebrows approach for anterior circulation eyes. As, as you know, uh, without knowing pros and cons of the keyhole surgeries, we cannot perform the safe uh, keyhole surgeries. So I expect Professor uh, uh, Auslan, uh, I expect Professor Auslan will focus on the surgical indication of keyhole surgeries. So uh, Professor Auslan, could you start your lecture, please? Um, yes, uh, thank you for uh, such a nice introduction. Yes, I'll try to share my um, expertise and knowledge about this approach. Since uh, this is a, a webinar for ed educational purposes, I also concentrate uh, on uh, the approach itself, some indications, and of course, uh, as it was mentioned in the name of the lecture, uh, also going to focus on the pros and cons of this approach. And um, yes, um, um, once again, um, uh, so um, hello to all the participants and uh, um, and uh, members of the board, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to be here and uh, to give this lecture and uh, and to provide you uh, uh, with the information about this particular approach. And before I start my presentation, I really once again would like to thank you for this kind of invitation. I really appreciate it, and also I'd like to uh, thank you, Professor Kato, first of all, and. Uh, uh, the man here on the presentation on the right, uh, probably everybody can recognize him, uh, although he is behind the microscope. Um, he is also my mentor, Professor Hirves Nemi, and uh, his word can open many doors. And actually, that happened in this particular situation. And also, big thanks for, uh, from me to him about this opportunity. Well, uh, since uh, today we're going to talk about aneurysms, uh, um, first of all, uh, I, I tell you uh, in a few slides about my country, so uh, maybe you're not familiar uh, with my country. So it's um, a small country, as you can see there on the screen, nearby the Baltic Sea. We are located in the eastern side of uh, Europe, and um, although the data here on the screen are maybe not uh, fresh anymore. However, still, uh, we can say that um, 
uh, that uh, the data in our country uh, can be recognized as average compared to the other European regions. Um, however, of course, we all aware of that that uh, uh, that uh, due to the based on the data from the Finland and also from other parts of the world, uh, uh, the <clears throat> rate of suburban hemorrhage is decreasing due to the fact that. Uh, People are smoking less. Also, they are controlling the arterial, arterial hypertension better, and altogether is leading to the diminished rates of um, uh, suburban hemorrhages. Although, uh, still, maybe typical and uh, regular patient, what we see in our emergency department uh, is uh, someone uh, who has been admitted uh, to our emergency department somewhere from the countryside with uncontrolled arterial hypertension and maybe uh, not uh, uh, which has been smoking for some period of time prior and uh, of course I, I'm uh, pretty sure that you are all familiar uh, with those uh, um, research pa papers which changed our daily practice uh, uh, especially I'm talking about the CISIS trial uh, which uh, at least in Europe, dramatically changed the approach uh, how we are handling the aneurysms away from the surgical clipping. And um, actually it took um, many years for us neurosurgeons uh, to come back and to fight back. Uh, and now we know that uh, um, although the initially the endovascular treatment has some advantages over the, the surgical clipping but after one year, those differences are no longer statistically significant. And also, of course, we are well aware of the fact that um, uh, besides uh, many advantages, which has the endovascular treatment, it also has uh, some disadvantages. Uh, for example, uh, the alteration rates and uh, the rates of the, of the retreatment which are needed um, in some certain percentage of um, those patients. So, but anyway, we know that uh, uh, we have to keep, if we want to treat aneurysms, uh, that means that we have to keep both those treatment modalities available. So we have to concentrate the patients and the resources. And of course, as a neurosurgeons, we have to get, uh, get better. And also we have to learn the good, good clipping. And also we have to learn the different kind of approaches. And let's say maybe some small advantage uh, for my country and uh, for my location uh, in this particular case is that we are not far away from Finland, from Helsinki, so it takes maybe one hour with a plane, so we can go there, we can learn good clipping and then return back and provide uh, good care for our uh, patients locally. And uh, just uh, maybe uh, also I'd like to provide you uh, with the numbers from my country, and as you may understand, since I'm coming from Pretty small country, our population is less than 2 million inhabitants, so I'm not going to impress you today with the big numbers. <laughs> and um, probably um, similarly uh, to the other parts of, part of the Europe, also we have this trend uh, towards the endovascular calling. And as you can see uh, from the data here on the screen, so the rates of the direct clipping uh, is decreasing. Although this decrease is not very steep, but still, still. And um, if we look uh, to the current numbers uh, for this year, you can see that for two neurosurgeons, which are flipping the aneurysms in my department, so actually we have uh, roughly 15 cases if we divide it uh, per two neurosurgeons, and most of them uh, are the ACM aneurysms, either ruptured ones or ruptured ones with the SAH or intracerebral hemorrhage, and also some ACOMs, PCOMs, and uh, PIKE as well. And, uh, of course, uh, this is one more argument. So uh, even if we are small in our numbers, so we have to fight with those uh, who have bigger numbers. And, of course, the main thing for us is uh, we have to provide really good results. And that's why it is important to, to learn things and uh, to try to improve your performance and to get better. And uh, uh, in, in um, basically in my country, uh, in many cases, the local policy is, uh, well, um, our junior residents and, and maybe other doctors uh, uh, 
uh, try to use the calling as a fir first uh, choice policy, except, um, you know, I took some um, pictures out from my, my iPhone, and usually uh, those aneurysms you get for the treatment are either uh, ugly looking uh, uh, polycystic uh, aneurysms, which are sort of not suitable for the endoscope treatment, uh, or it has uh, some different uh, difficult anatomy, or they are presenting with a big interval bleedings, uh, with an interventricular extension or into the subdural space. And of course, for all those cases, uh, we have to do the surgery and those are cases are not really suitable for the eyebrow surgery itself. And uh, here on the screen, uh, you can see also one example which was treated uh, not by the eyebrow approach, but uh, with a conventional um, uh, terminal craniotomy and um, a patient which was presenting with a big uh, a thrombosed uh, MCA aneurysm and uh, luckily, actually during the surgery and during the examinations, it was revealed that the aneurysm had pretty small neck and uh, surprisingly uh, also during the surgery, it was uh, pretty easy uh, to approach the aneurysm, uh, to do the appropriate clipping of um, the neck of the aneurysm and also to uh, take away uh, the uh, thrombotic masses and also finally completely remove the aneurysm suck. And uh, finally, it turned out uh, also with a good um, result for the functional good result for the patient and also um, good follow-up studies. And as you can see, of course, this situation uh, not really for the eyebrow approach, but for uh, uh, the conventional parallel approach. So one more situation uh, that uh, you have really tense uh, uh, situation with a high poor grade uh, subarachne bleeding uh, with intercerebral uh, bleed as well. So we have the really tense brain and uh, however, uh, still you have to go down uh, to the arachnoid membranes, you have to do the arachnoid section, so you have to uh, split the sylvian fissure, so you have, have to find the aneurysm, so you have to um, uh, find the proximal um, um, blood vessel, you have to um, find the distal blood vessels, uh, also you have to apply the clip, so and then you can um, modify it uh, using uh, um, uh, suction and and reapplication of the clip and uh, in those cases uh, maybe also you uh, feel more comfortable if you have a um, wider uh, approach let's say a classical optimal approach instead of the eyebrow approach and also still we have to do uh, the ventriculostomies uh, sometimes we have to do the decompressive craniectomies and of course that's uh, our daily practice and um, in all those cases, as already mentioned, uh, so this terminal approach, of course, this is a classical approach. And uh, as a junior resident, you have to learn it uh, as the, um, just uh, as one of the first approaches uh, and which is suitable for many uh, different kind of pathologies. And we know that actually by this approach, you can do a lot of uh, beautiful surgeries with a really good results. And... Uh, Although, actually, this classical perineal um, craniotomy is pretty big craniotomy. And so far, uh, there have, have been, you know, um, different kind of approaches used, which are uh, sort of minimizing this bony approach. Uh, let's say, for example, lateral supraorbital approach, mini pterional approach. However, still for those approaches, um, we usually are using uh, the long, uh, you know, big um, uh, skin incision and to reach this certain area, still we have those complications, which we are usually not very happy to see in our patients. So by that I mean that um, this extensive approach can lead to the atrophy of the temporal muscle and superficial temporal fat pad, and actually it can lead to really ugly consequences, especially if we, if we talk about the ladies. So if you are um, you know, delicate uh, with your manipulation, you can injure make an injury in the facial nerve, frontal branch, and the soft tissue. 
Uh, and bone exposure uh, also leads to the uh, sort of more prominent brain retraction. And uh, in many cases, actually, the size of the lesion is not always proportionate to the extent of the brain um, exposure. And um, actually, uh, now I'm turning uh, to the uh, topic I have today uh, talk today. And actually, that's basically the purpose why uh, it's good to have uh, this uh, type of approach in your armamentarium. And it's really, uh, you know, good to be um, um, be familiar with such approach. And there are certain uh, really good indications also to use it in your daily practice. And um, for sure, this superorbital approach has many advantages, uh, which are listed here. So I'd like to name them. Uh, um, so it's using this approach, uh, we can dramatically reduce the size of the skin incision and craniotomy. So we can spare the temporal muscle. So definitely there's less need for dural opening. So there's less brain exposure. There's less retraction. And finally, actually, you can really have this nice uh, incision just over the eyebrow uh, with a good uh, approach. And also it allow you uh, to do the clipping of the aneurysm as well. And in this particular approach, you are using this keyhole principle. So that means that uh, when you are looking through the keyhole craniotomy, actually uh, the optical field is widening uh, with increased distance from the keyhole. Of course, here in this particular situation, uh, you have to make appropriate size craniotomy. Otherwise, you'll not be able to see anything at all. And also, you'll, you'll not be able to handle your instruments. But still, in this um, principle for this approach is so-called keyhole approach. And uh, there are certain indications to use this type of approach. Of course, today we're talking about aneurysms. However, also, you can use this approach for different kind of other pathologies. And basically, just uh, depending on uh, the side you are approaching, uh, your target, you can cover the anterior skull base, um, region in anterior fossa, uh, in some parts of middle fossa around the cellar region. And of course, you have to keep in mind that there are sort of uh, certain slopes in anterior skull base, let's say around the cribriform plate. So, and uh, around uh, um, the um, sphenoid uh, wing dorsum of the cell, uh, which are uh, slightly hidden uh, when you're using such approach. And in those cases, um, the good uh, tool to help you is endoscopic assistance. Of course, maybe not really in the case of aneurysm surgery, but it's also a good uh, tool to consider if you're in doubt uh, that you can uh, you have done the good uh, clipping. So also you, we have to keep in mind that uh, the distance uh, from the uh, start until the target is longer uh, than uh, if we are using the uh, classical pernal approach. And also we have to keep in mind in both cases you have to use appropriate instruments. So that means that, that the shot of the instrument should be pretty long enough uh, just to reach your target. And also the tips of the instruments, they should be slightly curved uh, to give you extra uh, millimeters uh, and to improve the visualization. And uh, when you are planning approach, there are certain um, uh, sort of anatomical landmarks uh, you have to uh, keep in your mind. And namely, so you have the superficial temporal artery. So you have this frontal temporal branch of the facial nerve. So you have the supraorbital artery. You have the supraorbital nerve. So you have this temporalis muscle. You have the zygomatic process of so the frontal lobe. And also you have this frontal sinus. And all those structures you have to take into account when you're planning this particular approach. And just let me go uh, briefly uh, through the steps of this uh, particular approach. And of course, uh, we have to start with the basics. So uh, the, one of the basic things is the head positioning. So that means you have to lift up the head. You have to rotate it according to the aneurysm you are approaching. So in the case of ache aneurysm, maybe the rotation uh, will be in a smaller angle. So it's MSA. So we're going to rotate the head more. And also you have to extend the head to allow um, uh, to, for the brain to fall down by the gravity. So those are small but very important steps. Uh, the next step is about the skin incision. Uh, there are certain things which are important to mention. So that uh, actually 
there are many controversies um, uh, in between the uh, authors which are uh, which have published about this type of approach. So one are, the, the argue that you have to do it within the eyebrow. Uh, some are arguing that you have to do it just above the eyebrow. But I think the um, um, the decision should be based on case basis, uh, and uh, you have to take into account this cosmetic effect of uh, this incision. And of course, medially you have to um, uh, basically you have to stay within a, um, the hairline, and medially it should be limited by the supersolar foramen, not to cause an artificial damage to the supraorbital nerve. So the other important step is that after the skin incision, so you have to make really a good plane in between the subcutaneous tissue and the uh, muscle fascia, especially uh, it's um, concerning the area upwards and medial and laterally in order to get the good access also to the muscle and also to the brain. And usually I try not to go um, um, downwards with this um, uh, dissection. Otherwise, on the next day, a uh, patient is going to wake up uh, with a big periorbital hemorrhage and neither you nor your patient will be happy about uh, this type of complication. So, after the skin incision, so you have to uh, make this uh, muscular fascia flap. So, usually I um, uh, use it, uh, just I cut it in a slightly curved linear uh, manner. And of course, you have to keep in mind that no perpendicular cut should be done in this region, uh, uh, just um, around the supertemporal line. Otherwise, you can damage uh, the branches of the facial nerve. And, um, uh, well, when you're done with the incision in the muscle, so you, then you have to strip it down. And, uh, and then you either can use metallic hooks or sutures or attractors just to keep um, uh, the, um, the wound open. So, as the next step is the craniotomy. So, basically, here on uh, this picture, so you are ready for the craniotomy, and there are certain and very um, um, just obvious landmarks which you have to use. So, one is superior temporal line. So, underneath this line, you have to make one single burr hole, and uh, also, and you have to do the appropriate craniotomy, just not uh, only in the length, but also in the high, so which is very important. So don't make it very small, otherwise you will get into trouble with your approach. And <clears throat> when you are done with the craniotomy, the other important uh, step is that you have to use your drill and uh, you have to drill the inner cortical layer in order to get more space and uh, uh, more area um, just to uh, look down uh, into the intracranial cavity. So. And uh, in some cases, especially if uh, those are MCA aneurysms, uh, there are some, some indications when the sphenoid uh, bone has, um, be, uh, has to be drilled in order to get uh, more extra space. And uh, also one more thing that we have to keep in mind that uh, this is usually before the craniotomy, you have to appreciate uh, the location of the frontal sinus. And uh, if you, especially if you are at the beginning of your career, uh, so you can use some certain tools just not to get in, uh, just incidentally into the trouble. So the one option is you can use a neural navigation just uh, to, uh, to tailor your approach. And it's uh, good uh, for the craniotomy itself, and also later on, especially if you, you know, if you, uh, those are your first cases of the aneurysm clipping. So it's good to use the neuroindication just to locate sometimes and uh, try to find the aneurysm. So it's just a good tool. It's not compulsory to use, but this is this is an option. So then you have to open up uh, the dura in a semi-circular way. So, uh, and then according to the target you are approaching, uh, you can uh, do the arachnoidal dissection um, or you can split the silver fissure or uh, if it's needed, uh, you can open up the lumen terminals. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, a very good marker. So uh, this is good uh, in the case when you are chasing A1 segment. So if you follow the optic nerve, so in the... Uh, area of the hyism, usually you can find this A1 segment on the right and on the left, and just um, uh, underneath the A1s, so if you see this blue structure, this is the anterior flow of the third ventricle, and uh, this is uh, the lumen terminals, and if it's needed, so you can open up uh, the um, 
anterior wall of third ventricle and get uh, uh, extra relaxation of the brain, which is underneath. So, and then uh, the last but not the least um, uh, point, uh, which is also very, very important. So this is the closure. So the option to uh, close the dura properly and also to train your microsurgical skills is that you, you can use a microscope and this will allow you to avoid some kind of um, CSF leaks. So uh, then you have to fix the bone. So, and uh, then basically it depends on uh, the equipment which is available in your department. So, and uh, you can use either the uh, plates or, 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 or cranial flex plates or sometimes thread if the plates are not available. Um, and then you have to close properly the muscle subcutaneous level, and usually I personally prefer the intracutaneous um, suture for the skin incision. And then you can uh, reinforce uh, the skin incision um, using the stereotype plaster. <clears throat> and um, there are some uh, certain things about um, uh, this um, approach uh, which you have to discuss with the patient. So those are not some kind of devastating complications. However, still, there are the potential uh, risks which can, uh, if you look in the long term on the, or in the short term, can interfere the um, sort of overall um, satis uh, satisfaction result out from the surgery in uh, those certain cases. So uh, by that, I mean that patient uh, can present after the surgery with frontal numbness due to the damage of the orbital nerve. So also either due to the traction or um, uh, due to the direct lesion of the uh, frontal branch of the facial nerve. It can lead to the muscle weakness. Um, also, um, you can open up the frontal sinus, and usually that's not a problem. You can uh, um, just fix it using the bone wax, but still, this is complication the patient should be aware of, and also the CSF leak. And um, maybe what is one more thing, which is um, maybe characteristic more, for this superorbital approach, if you compare to the classical pternal approach, is this olfactory dysfunction, uh, especially if you're um, um, chasing the ACOM aneurysm, um, if you compare to the ACM aneurysms, then actually those patients, they can uh, suffer more from this olfactory dysfunction if you compare to the conventional surgery. Probably this is due to this long longitudinal compression of the Factor in nerve instead of the sort of um, um, perpendicular um, yeah, compression, uh, uh, what you have during this conventional uh, conventional um, uh, terminal approach. And let me uh, show you just a few examples of, of um, my personal experience. So, uh, uh, this is uh, one patient uh, which had a ruptured acomalarism. So, and uh, well, that was one of the first patients um, I personally operated. So, and as you can see, this is his um, cosmetic result um, after one week after the clipping of the ruptured acom aneurysm. So, as you can see, the aneurysm is uh, nicely looking um, uh, aneurysm, probably uh, maybe not complicated one. So, a small craniotomy and also uh, one week after the surgery, it seems that the cosmetic result uh, it seems uh, pretty decent and and good um, for the patient. But one more example here. So the patient with a MCA aneurysm, which was done unruptured MCA aneurysm, which was done uh, through the eyebrow approach on the right. Actually, initially, the patient presented with a ruptured uh, MCA aneurysm on the left, and here you can see the bony opening on the left and on the right. So the left one was the classical pternal approach, and with a a much wider bone exposure, and on the right, um, you can see, see and appreciate the superorbital approach, and also cosmetic effect in the long term uh, looks, uh, looks um, pretty good. So, um, the next patient, so with an unruptured ACOM aneurysm, so and um, here you can see uh, um, MRI data and CTA data. Uh, just prior to the surgery. And actually, this patient was uh, operated uh, previous week. And um, here you can see some uh, interoperative uh, pictures um, from our approach. So here, uh, this is marking uh, of the skin incision, which is slightly, just maybe, let's say, in the border in between the um, uh, 
uh, on the eyebrow, so the area is draped, so the skin incision has been performed and the stitches are placed just to widen um, the area of approach and the muscle has been cut and, and the muscle has been stripped down and the craniotomy has been performed. And um, here is also the short video of, of this case. So that uh, 57 years old lady, so we operated here. And uh, of course, uh, it's good to do the evaluation uh, of the pictures prior to the surgical approach. So once again, you see the uh, pictures. So the craniotomy has been performed. And uh, now we are using the drill uh, to just to uh, diamond drill to drill away some bony eminences, so which uh, can interfere with a, a interoperative approach. So then you open up the dura, you make a tack up suture, and then you use a microscope. Uh, so this is the optic nerve. So this is a carotid artery. So you make the uh, arachnoidal dissection, <clears throat> and. Um, and um, here you see the laminate terminalis, just in a small, in a short glimpse. And uh, since the aneurysm was uh, located uh, upwards, just and um, uh, I had to uh, uh, do just focused uh, uh, resection of the gyrus rectus just over the aneurysm, get, just in order to get the proper approach. So here is the one neck of the aneurysm on the right. So, and uh, here is the other neck of the aneurysm on the left. So, uh, and uh, so since the approach was um, made from the left side, so you have to use your left hand uh, uh, to properly place uh, the clip uh, over the aneurysm and uh, to do the proper clipping um, of uh, the aneurysm. So and then of course you have to do the inspection. Is everything fine? And uh, if uh, there are no complications um, out from the surgery as well. And um, uh, patient, uh, this is the positive result of the skin closure. So which was closed by the intracutaneous suture. So this is um, scout CT, and there is the bony window uh, window through which the surgery was performed, and uh, also there are uh, follow up um, CT scan uh, with a, um, a bony window and also the um, brain window, and which um, doesn't show any kind of um, ischemic. So maybe one um, good example, actually, uh, just uh, for um, uh, uh, clipping, if you talk about the echomalarism, so this is uh, echomalarism, which is uh, projecting downwards. Um, and of course, in those situations, you have to be aware and uh, not to apply too much structure. Otherwise, you can uh, have the rupture. Uh, prior, you can uh, have this proximal control. But otherwise, straight way and uh, you can do the... Uh, uh, straight good clipping of the aeromanorism and actually this way uh, to approach the aeromanorism is really good and straightforward and you have can have the good result and uh, finally uh, one more example uh, uh, with a young lady so and uh, uh, she was um, pre uh, presented uh, presenting with a proximal um, MCA aneurysm and uh, uh, with a nasty sort of anatomical um, um, sort of variation that uh, he she had a small aneurysm, and from aneurysm dome there's one uh, blood vessel which is rising there. And uh, initially, since she was uh, she since she's a young lady, she consulted with our, our endoscopic team, and uh, they uh, you know looked for a possibility uh, to do the uh, closure of the aneurysm by the endoscopic means, but finally it was refused by the our endoscopic specialists and. Uh, um, finally, we agreed uh, on the uh, direct surgery and also um, um, uh, with the clipping of the aneurysm, which uh, finally was performed. So, and small aneurysm and also a uh, small approach and um, good result of the clipping. So, uh, as already uh, uh, mentioned in the beginning of my honor, uh, of my honor, of my talk about that, those aneurysms, I'm not really. Can't really impress you with the huge numbers. So, but still, still, um, usually those are maybe um, 
five, six aneurysms per year, uh, which I uh, uh, do uh, through this um, eyebrow approach. And uh, the majority of those are um, uh, MC aneurysms, ACOM aneurysms, and uh, also there are um, a few PCOM aneurysms as well. And the uh, majority of those are unruptured aneurysms. And now, um, uh, since I have some experience uh, regarding the treatment of uh, those aneurysms, I can also talk about the cons about this approach. So, and uh, let me go through them. So, one is uh, uh, you have to talk and you have to think about the learning curve. So, the first argument is about the approach itself. So, although uh, it doesn't seem very complicated, it takes um, some cases and it takes, uh, uh, you know, some anatom anatomical studies for you to learn approach. But usually, usually this learning curve is pretty steep. And, uh, and although uh, during the first cases, you uh, really can get uh, disoriented uh, by, by, uh, by the area. So, sometimes you end up... Uh, when you get uh, just accidentally enter the orbiter or somehow you are disoriented by the approach, but usually the learning curve is pretty steep and uh, you can uh, get uh, a good, uh, uh, good, good, um, good experience uh, with the cases. Well, of course, the other thing is uh, the approach itself, uh, but the other thing uh, also you have to consider is uh, how you're going to deal with aneurysm. And in those cases, of course, you have to be really confident. Uh, and uh, uh, to me, I think that, uh, of course, maybe the, the orbital approach is not really the first approach. You have to start your career when you are dealing with aneurysms. So you have to gain some confidence, experience uh, dealing with those um, with a classical abdominal approach. And then you, you have to get this confidence uh, how to deal with the brain edema, how to deal... Uh, with a splitting of cilia fissures, uh, splitting cilia fissure uh, control, accidental bleeding. So uh, when you are confident, then you can turn to this uh, mini invasive supraorbital approach. So the other thing is, which was already mentioned prior to, uh, to my lecture, so this is closure of the dura. So it can be really challenging. Sometimes, you know, the usually the median of uh, age of our patients is around 50, 60, maybe a older age. Uh, and the, uh, during those cases, they can be very fragile and uh, it, it's pretty easy to make some holes in the dura. And therefore, in those cases, you have to use a small needle uh, and a small thread and uh, you have to uh, just um, take your time and uh, do the proper closure in order uh, to get um, uh, rid of different kind of complications, which can uh, really interfere uh, the cosmetic effect of um, the approach and also result of the surgery. And the third, um, you know, question for the debate is really about the cosmetic outcome. You know, uh, uh, there are also many arguments around that probably this um, eyebrow approach um, can lead maybe not to so. Um, obvious um, advantages um, um, if you compare to the classical external approach and but to have this really good cosmetic outcome so you have to really pay many um, many minutes and, and 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 you have to take your time and really close um, the wound properly and also there are uh, different kind of arguments uh, which are why maybe many neurosurgeons they are not very keen uh, about using this approach and actually uh, um, those arguments are very rational and actually they are they have uh, the place to be there so uh, one thing is uh, if you are approaching the aneurysm through such a small um, opening are you going to be able uh, to handle the brain swelling if that's the case but in those cases maybe the argument uh, for you know um uh, and which uh, play for you. So you uh, have to have the good cooperation with your anesthesiology team, so it can help you to cope with the brain swelling. And uh, also you have those arachnoidal spaces you can split. So you have this uh, lamina thermos analysis you can open. So, and uh, basically there are certain things how you can uh, deal with the brain swelling. And maybe one of the most important things and the uh, questions you have to answer uh, is... Uh, are you ready uh, and are you um, capable uh, to handle uh, the unexpected rupture? So, and here I would uh, like to distinguish two situations. So one is when you have this proximal control. In those situations, 
basically the situation doesn't differ from the classical optimal approach. You have this proximal control and you have to have a plan in your head what you're going to do, so where you're going to apply the clip, how you can act in the situation, and um, you can get the situation under control. If you have the unexpected rupture prior to proximal control, of course, this is really an unpleasant situation and you're getting into trouble. But you are getting into the trouble not only in this um, supraorbital approach, but also in a classical optimal approach. And also in those cases, um, sometimes it can be tricky. So sometimes you have to uh, remove some part of the brain which is coming out. But still, the uh, just uh, main way to the success is that you have to have a plan how you're going to handle the situation in your brain. Also, there are some certain limitations um, uh, about this approach, and uh, you have to take into account prior you choose to treat uh, the patient with this particular approach. So this is limited, limited working angles, smaller surgical corridor, so supraorbital rim uh, often impairs the visualization. So and uh, actually also you need uh, to apply maybe slightly more brain traction. So it's not really suitable for all PCOMs, not for distal ACM aneurysms. So probably, definitely, actually not probably, but definitely, that's not the best approach for the large and complex aneurysms. Um, the debatable question is, what in the case the patient has a small eyebrow? So what to do in this particular case? So you have to discuss it with the patient. High grade SAH, cerebral edema, this is the question which was already covered in the previous slide. And of course, sometimes even, uh, you know, with all the means, you st still have this uh, tight brain. And it's in a case of, uh, let's say, classical nocturnal approach, there are options you can use uh, to get the relaxed brain. For example, you can puncture the ventricle. In the case of supraorbital um, approach, so you don't have this, uh, this um, option. So. Those are things you have to consider before you choose uh, this particular approach. So, and here maybe just uh, also slide with uh, just um, uh, visual um, confirmation. So that probably, probably uh, this um, approach uh, would not be really suitable for giant aneurysms and also distal MC aneurysms due to this anatomical projection. <laughs> and... Um, of course, uh, just if you're going to choose this uh, particular craniotomy, so you have to keep in mind that due to the small craniotomy, there is less opportunity for uh, change of plan. So if unexpected findings occur during the surgery. And basically, the way to success, at least in my opinion, is that uh, for each individual patient, you should be, um, you should evaluate, evaluate uh, um, whether this approach uh, going to allow you for proximal control, for the dissection of the aneurysm, and for the application of the clip of the aneurysm. So basically, um, you have to have a really good plan prior to use this approach. And uh, if we talk about the pros, uh, of course, there are many pros which were already mentioned in the uh, previous slides. So let's say those, uh, for example, those sm small skin incisions, so good cosmetic outcome less reduction or less exposure to the brain, so preservation of the um, temporal muscle and the arteries and, and frontal branch of facial nerve, and also uh, maybe uh, the other ones which were not mentioned uh, in the presentation, so that, that you can uh, do the surgery in a shorter period of time, so, and also it's going to reduce the use of general anesthesia. So usually those patients rapidly recover after the surgery and of course also it, it leads to the shorter hospitalization time and reduced hospital costs uh, which are going to be appreciated um, not only by the patient by, but also the hospital officials and um, usually this is uh, also important point and um, um, as a final remarks uh, I'd like to uh, conclude my um, presentation that uh, I think for this um, particular uh, approach, the key factor is the patient selection. So, uh, and uh, of course, uh, also you have to be aware that uh, by this approach, you cannot increase the risk for the patient. So, and you have to be really confident in yourself that uh, you can do this type of approach and you can do the proper clipping. And uh, also the question, is it all also 
just only for the ruptured anterior circulation aneurysm. So my uh, answer here is that yes, uh, this is uh, for the beginning. So, but uh, as soon as you get the confidence and you are familiar with the uh, approach itself, uh, for still for the selected patients and selected cases also, it's very good approach also for the ruptured anterior circulation aneurysm. And my take-home messages would be uh, that uh, the supraorbital keyhole approach is optimal for small, medium, proximal anterior circulation aneurysms. So knowledge of the anatomy and surgical experience is needed. So skin incision must be limited medially for ciliary foramen, not to get into, into the um, complications. So apanortic flap limits the risk of the damage of the frontal branch or the facial nerve. So outcomes are similar or even better compared to the other approaches. And of course, uh, besides the aneurysm surgery, we can consider this uh, particular approach also for other pathologies, for, let's say, for example, for the tumors. And uh, before uh, I conclude uh, my presentation, so just a small remark. So, and uh, one picture from the Helsing from Finland, uh, and that was before the COVID times. And actually, I went there for um, microsurgery courses. And uh, when I returned back, uh, and I was, when I was driving uh, out from the um, hotel parking, I saw this uh, beautiful bad day. So, uh, so this beautiful car uh, with a mark, uh, which uh, was stated a bad day. So, and as you can see, this is the bad day in uh, Helsinki, Hels uh, Finland, exactly Helsinki. So that um, um, I'd like to uh, thank you uh, for your attention. And of course, uh, I wish you many bad days uh, as uh, they are in the Helsinki uh, for the next year. And also uh, I'd like to encourage uh, you to try to use this particular approach for the clipping of the aneurysm. So, and thank you for your attention and happy next year. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hausland, for your clear lecture with uh, beautiful videos. Thank you very much. Professor Ausland, uh, you mentioned about the indication of the supraorbital keyhole approach for the MCA and, mm -hmm. and you a little bit mentioned about the indication of MCA anism. Mm -hmm. uh, if the anism has a short M1, mm -hmm. I think it's better for the, it's good for the uh, supraorbital keyhole approach. But mm -hmm. most of the MCA is, is located the lateral part of the Serbian mm -hmm. fissures. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the uh, M1 is long, I think sprawbital uh, approach is not so good. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to insist in the uh, sprawl eyebrow skin incision for the MCA eyes. But uh, according to your data, uh, you operated many MCA cases. I think more than ACOM analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you use uh, so many eyebrow uh, sprawbital keyhole approach mm -hmm. for the MCA analysis? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, thank you, for Professor, for your comment and also for your question. So it's um, a really obvious question, which is arising from the presentation. But uh, maybe, maybe in some case, maybe in the situation, the uh, um, answer is pretty simple because, you know, um, nowadays, um, due to the, you know, um, the fact that uh, we know that uh, majority of cases, um, uh, patients with MCI aneurysms are transferred to the neurosurgeons for the direct clipping, not really for the endoscopic calling. And probably that's why you have more of those MC aneurysms, uh, especially for um, just you have to you have, you have to deal with that. And probably that's uh, that's why uh, at least partially this is the answer to to this question. So the other thing is you know that um, uh, majority of our patients they are not young anymore. And actually you know you have some sort of um, uh, brain atrophy and there is the why uh, the silver fissure is very wide. And and to be honest, it, maybe it's not so hard to get also distally into the MC uh, into the silver fissure uh, to to approach the aneurysm and probably. Mm, those are two arguments um, uh, uh, for um, also for the clipping of the MC aneurysm uh, you think this type. Okay, thank you. Another question is that uh, you didn't mention about the indication of ACOM mm -hmm. uh, because uh, ACOM aneurysms, there are so many kinds of aneurysms, not mm -hmm. only size, yeah. but also shape. 
but also the point of dawn is very yeah. important, I think. Mm -hmm. So yes. my case, I select the patient, the ACON patient. If the patient uh, is pointed inferior or anterior, I prefer to perform the uh, spra orbital keyhole approach, but I have never um, uh, apply a spra orbital keyhole approach for the anism. Uh, ACOM eyes pointed posterior or uh, superior mm -hmm. because I cannot see where well the uh, perforators behind the door. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, there are so many young neurosurgeons uh, uh, hearing your lectures. Mm -hmm. I think you had better mention about the indication of a communism for the sparbital keyhole. Uh, yes, I fully agree to you. So this is really a good remark. So um, uh, of course, the, um, well, as already mentioned, so you have to evaluate um, uh, uh, those patients on case on case basis. But I, I certainly agree to you that uh, um, best indications to do the, um, uh, this type of surgery for the ACOM aneurysms, uh, those are downwards looking, uh, projecting aneurysms and forward. And if you talk about the upward um, um, projecting aneurysms, um, actually I showed this video. So, and in, in that particular case, uh, of course, just to, you have to, uh, you know, to do the proper clipping, you have to see whole of, uh, of the complex of the ACOM. So, and, uh, and 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 of course you have to be aware and uh, really not to damage uh, the perforators which are coming out from the posterior wall uh, of uh, of the acom so and uh, and in that case um, yes probably that option is just just slightly over the aneurysm just to do the gyros, gyros rectus resection so that will give you some couple of extra millimeters but. Uh, I fully agree to you that the main indication will be the, uh, those aneurysms which are located. Uh, we will project them downwards and un anteriorly. Yes. Thank you for your remark. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, one question to Professor Ostlens is How many cases of intraoperative rupture had you had in your experience? And uh, what were the outcomes in those patients? Yes, thank you. So it's uh, usually a very important question. So when you're dealing with aneurysms, so it's uh, um, uh, uh, how you ha handle the interoperative rupture. So um, uh, to be uh, honest, luckily, uh, um, I haven't had uh, so far at least uh, interoperative rupture before. I, I don't have the proximal control. So and um, I think uh, that the question is about the planning, how you plan your approach and how you, um, yeah, how you analyze the pictures. So to which direction uh, aneurysm has bled. So either it has bled into the Benparenheim or it has bled just into the submarine space. And also you have to take into account the rotation and also the, uh, the direction where the fundus is um, is a sort of uh, projecting so and but uh, if you have uh, the uh, rupture uh, when you have the proximal control then it's uh, straightforward and and uh, uh, the same as uh, you do it in uh, internal approach so basically you, you first you have to just increase the suction so and 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 to get to the point uh, where exactly the bleeding is coming out and and of course the proximal uh, clip uh, application uh, so will diminish uh, the blood flow um, and uh, it, uh, it will allow you to uh, to to to, to um, get aware uh, of the point of the bleeding and uh, and uh, and um, and to handle the situation uh, properly. Um, the situation when you have the um, um, rupture of the nerves prior, you have the proximal control. Um, yeah. I, I really don't. Uh, I don't. Uh, I really wish nobody um, have this uh, situation um, in your surgical career. On the other hand, so if you do it with aneurysm, so you have to be ready to handle it. Uh, I, I, I personally don't uh, have, uh, didn't have such a situation uh, when I was approaching the aneurysm through the eyebrow approach. So, um, but uh, when you have the proximal control. Um, I think uh, you are in a secure area. So, and 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 uh, and also that one more argument here is that you know those are selective cases. Those are you know um, those are cases um, um, uh, when you are planning. So for a sort of good clipping and for uh, for a good good uh, clinical outcome, and uh, probably that's the key for, uh, for the success in those situations. Right. Thank you very much. Another question is like. Uh... 
the one of the major cons of uh, this uh, supra bro and many key journal is that when in an angry brain where there is no room for any retraction how would you proceed in such cases yes that's also the good argument and and and, and good question so and uh, so as already mentioned in the lecture so you can talk to your anesthesiology team so and uh, of course, you uh, uh, can start with the general measures. So, and uh, and um, if um, uh, let's say if this is a situation when you have the enlarged ventricles, so you can start with the ventriculostomy. So at first, so probably, probably, uh, and uh, also um, um, you, you have to go down, uh, and uh, you have to reach arachnoid spaces. And also uh, one more thing. Uh, you can get an extra space, so you can up the uh, lumen terminal. So usually it will uh, give you a plenty of space and, and help you deal with the brain edema. Okay, our second speaker has raised his hand. Yes, Dr. Wamsi. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Kasper, for a wonderful uh, lecture. So my question is: some of those cases that you have uh, shown have a bilateral decompressive craniectomy post aneurysm clipping. So I would like to know exactly what were the indications or does it have any kind of effect on the vasospasm that uh, uh, that, that follows post subarachnoid hemorrhage? Uh, uh, that was more like an example. So with that, um, um, but um, you know, in our neurosurgical practice, we can have uh, such cases when uh, we, you know, the subarachnoid bleeding is complex disease. So that means that it's not just how you deal with that. Aneurysm, but also this is the question of how you deal with the uh, uh, bleeding, uh, how you deal with the vasospasm, as you collectively mentioned, and also sometimes uh, uh, you have to deal although also with a really huge pain edema. So in that particular situation, uh, just it was the case when a patient had a diffuse subarachnoid bleeding, uh, the ventricle was inserted, but uh, didn't uh, get uh, the uh, relief um, um, uh, in order. Uh, uh, to diminish the brain edema. So when that was, uh, in that particular cho uh, situa situation, chosen to do the decompressive craniotomy. Uh, I can't really tell you exactly how it affected the cause of phosphospasm in this particular situation. So I, um, I don't have you uh, the direct answer. Okay. Thank you. Any questions yeah. by co-host Livun Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Raja. Thanks for a nice lecture. I have two questions, Professor. Uh, those patients with rupture aneurysm where uh, EVD uh, was placed earlier, uh, what is the optimal ICP that you look at where you think that is suitable for supraorbital? Uh, my second question uh, regarding the same one, if a one have already have EVD, you think it's still good to go for a supraorbital or better to go for transcranial? If the same patient who failed a supraorbital, do you at the same time prepare the head as if that you can convert to tyrone, standard tyrone approach? Uh, my, my second question, uh, Professor, regarding uh, whether the same patient, uh, is it any feasibility to do a wash-up of the subarachnoid hemorrhage as what we do in a uh, 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 standard uh, opening? Uh, and then uh, there also some practice using the eyelid, uh, upper eyelid uh, approach uh, compared to supraorbital. What is your opinion regarding this, Professor? Thank you. Um, okay, I'll try to answer. <laughs> um, uh, so... Um, um, Yes, so as already mentioned in the lecture, so those are at least my experience, um, just I can tell about my experience. So, but um, usually those are more like selected cases. And if you just, uh, I personally um, don't insist, in, you know, uh, that I have just uh, compulsory to have to do the cyber approach and in, in many cases. And if I have some doubt, I, um, I think, uh, you know, also you can tailor your approach, uh, classical, maybe, maybe pedonal or just supraorbital approach uh, and get some extra space by just conventional um, incision. And uh, if you have any doubt that, uh, let's say, you are expecting some kind of uh, problems with the brain edema or, or um, some certain uh, um, com possible complications, um, <clears throat> you can choose already originally this classical optimal approach instead of the eyebrow approach. And, uh, and, uh, and, and especially if you have some complicated patient, uh, which already had a um, EVD for, uh, let's say, hydrocephalus and, and, and uh, you have the brain edema and you're expecting some, that the uh, surgery will not be an easy one. So, and uh, in that particular case, I would rather uh, choose this uh, classical panel approach instead of the eyebrow approach. And, uh, 
and 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 and, and um, I personally don't have the experience with the eyelid approach, so um, I can't really comment on on uh, uh, on. I can't com com uh, personally can't can't compare those approaches. So maybe you have the if you have the experience, maybe you can give some comments about that, or maybe somebody thank, thank can. You, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, we can conclude this session. We can hear the concluding remarks from Professor Mori. I think uh, uh, Professor Arslan uh, talked us, give us a good aspect for the future aspect of keyhole surgeries. So uh, we have to know pros and cons of the keyhole surgeries. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, we cannot perform the uh, safe neurosurgery. So uh, as uh, Professor Ausland said that, we do not need to insist in uh, one approach, supraorbital approach. So in each case, we have to choose the best uh, approach for the patient, not for the doctors. It's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very valuable comment from our honorable chair, Professor Mori, who has a very large experience in IPRO approach. So with that, we'll wind up the first session. And I would like to inform our viewers that this has been broadcasted on WeChat, YouTube, and Zoom all over the world. And currently, as of now, we have around 370 people who have logged in on different channels. And we're extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. We'll move on to the second session, and which is a very interesting session about uh, endoscopic endonasal approach for ACF meningiomas. And we have our honored faculty from India, Professor Vamsi Krishna Iramnani. So, all yours, Professor. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> uh, inviting uh, for, for the for the talk. And the ACNS webinars uh, have been like uh, has has some of the eminent uh, faculty and the lectures like from which we learned and as well uh, now i got the opportunity to present our work too thank you professor Carto, dr uh, uh, raja and dr Seung for uh, giving me this opportunity and uh, uh, i'm going to talk on the endoscopic endonasal surgery for anterior cranial fossa uh, meningiomas so yeah that's uh, the place i work that's place of my work and uh, it, I come from uh, the city in the southern part of India, that's Hyderabad, and which is uh, uh, an industrial, uh, it's an IT, IT hub, uh, in an information technology hub and uh, software, uh, all the big companies and everything are there. That's the building that we work. And uh, so coming to our uh, topic, like, the most of these uh, skull based approaches like uh, which have been traditionally done by the craniotomy and uh, a lot of drilling and other things so in the recent uh, past decade like uh, advent of those uh, endonasal approaches and uh, uh, the the newer technology and which is uh, and the drill systems and everything has enabled us to uh, the bimanual approaches uh, sorry binostial approaches uh, which Everything has enabled us to to safely uh, uh, remove a lot of lesions. I mean, which were uh, earlier were pretty pretty much difficult. So, in uh, as uh, traditionally there, like uh, the the cella is the epicenter of uh, the skull base endoscopic skull base approaches, and uh, we started off with uh, started off with our we started off with the cellar up. Uh, with the cella, the pituitary tumor removals, and gradually we started removing tumors uh, which are uh, ha having extensions onto the uh, supracellar area. From there, we uh, gradually moved on to the anterior skull base and uh, removes, starting with the meningiomas and uh, other things. And then in the learning curve, uh, next came the uh, transclival approaches uh, with the posterior clinoid removals and, uh, and then the transoral odontoidectomy. So then finally came the central skull base approaches with uh, for craniopharyngiomas and, uh, and and other things. So for all these uh, in the part of the, as part of the learning curve, the the underlying thing is uh, we should have known the uh, the reconstruction of the skull base. Uh, our our technique and uh, multi layer techniques and everything has to has to get uh, better and. Uh, 
that's our uh, team skullbase team at uh, uh, at our place like that's my colleagues and uh, residents and uh, fellows who uh, assist us in showing the scope and, uh, uh, and and help us in achieve the results that we are able to achieve in now so coming to the anti rest skullbase meningiomas uh, we have uh, here like there are uh, uh, the mainly the anterior cranial fossa meningiomas uh, have uh, this supracellar meningiomas, the, the tuberculum cellar meningiomas, and uh, yeah. the, the plantar meningiomas, which have extensions. The anterior cranial fossa meningiomas, uh, uh, most of them that we have treated are the the tuber plantar meningiomas with uh, extensions into the cella and as well as to the towards the uh, that tuberculum cellar, cella and uh, the plantar part. The other meningiomas in the anterior cranial fossa are the olfactory groove meningiomas. But uh, so the problem with uh, treating these, the olfactory groove meningiomas uh, is we have to destroy the, uh, uh, the cribriform plate, which uh, involves the smell of, uh, in these. So most of these tumors, when they are smaller, they come with the, most of these patients, they come with preserved smell. And uh, the other, uh, uh, the, when they become bigger, they extend much beyond the, the orbits and we won't be able to remove the entire of the tumor along with its uh, dural attachment. So we could not, uh, in the last five years, could not find a tumor which is uh, very appropriate uh, for, for, for excising it by, uh, by an endo, endoscopic endonasal approach. So most of our work is uh, uh, based upon uh, uh, removing the tuberculum cell meningiomas. So coming to the relevant anatomy for uh, removal of uh, these, these tumors by the endonasal approaches is, they, this is the endoscopic view of the uh, skull. The, the cella is the epicenter of uh, these, these approaches. And uh, that's the ICA, the carotid canal. And we have the optic canal out here. And this is the medial OCR. Medial OCR is basically the confluence of where uh, the junk, it stands, it sits at the junction of the cella, carotid canal and the optic uh, canal and uh, uh, the, the anterior cranial fossa. So for uh, removing of any of these anterior cranial fossa uh, lesions, the medial OCR removal becomes uh, mandatory. And this is basically the gateway for uh, being able to remove any anterior cranial fossa uh, tumors. So the same anatomy, when we look from the top, this is the uh, the, the medial OCR corresponds to this part of the tuberculum, and uh, there is a there is a prechiasmatic sulcus, and there is a sphenoid limbus, and the and the planum. So, why the, the basic question when we go for uh, these things that comes is uh, why endonasal approaches? Uh, we can do a keyhole craniotomy very much and can remove these tumors in one and a half to two hours. So, why should we even go for uh, about our transcranial trans endonasal approaches? So. The, the crux lies in the point that most of these uh, tuberculum cella meningiomas, uh, the one which are uh, extending on the planum and tuberculum cella based uh, meningiomas, they have their extensions uh, into the optic canal on the medial aspect of the optic nerve. And by going by, by a craniotomy, a traditional craniotomy and uh, drilling of the ACP and uh, deroofing of the optic canal, we are able to see the tumor, but we are, won't be able to dissect out the superior hypophyseal perforators and other things from the tumor. So that's where lies the, the, the problem in, uh, in, being able, in being able to remove these tumors completely without damaging any of the vascular supply by the superior hypophyseal perforators to the optic nerve chiasm and uh, the pituitary stalk. So if we look at the superior hypophyseal perforator anatomy, is the paper by Truong uh, uh, et al., uh, the group uh, consisting of Fernandez Miranda and uh, Paul Gardner. So th they have uh, dissected the, the superior hypophyseal perforators and have shown uh, wonderful anatomy uh, of the superior hypophyseal perforators. So the, the, the superior hypophyseal perforators come from the carotid and they supply the chiasm, the pituitary stalk, and the, the climb up onto the optic nerve on the medial aspect and supply the optic nerve. So this, this way uh, lies, I mean, removal of these tumors uh, basically involves 
quite often when these extensions of these tumors are there on the medial aspect of the optic nerve, these, these perforators are the one which are either attached to the tumors or sometimes even maybe partly supplying the tumor too. So when we're going by a transcranial approach, it becomes very difficult to be able to see these tumors and dissect them under vision. Uh, so that's where lies the problem. Even a single perforator damage here can cause uh, a visual loss. So coming to the cases, see, um, the first case that uh, the patient presenting with a young female presenting with a bitemporal uh, hemianopia and uh, headache, the tumor with uh, more extension towards the uh, left side. And when we see this coronal images, most often like we'll see uh, the extensions of these tumors over the carotid, but a lot of times they may not be really adherent to the, the carotid, so they can very well be removed. So the scans uh, has to be looked at and uh, the extension over the carotid should not preclude our uh, uh, endonasal approaches. So this is uh, the nasoceptal flap has been elevated after a wide spinoidotomy. Uh, uh, the drilling of the over the cella has been included because this slight cellar extension of this, uh, this lesion and the medial OCR has been done. And uh, entire of the drilling, marking of the craniotomy and uh, everything is done under navigation guidance. And after drilling of the, uh, or the cella, uh, the tuberculum cella part and the medial OCR, the craniotomy, the anterior cranial fossa craniotomy is marked with, with the drill. This is a 3 mm diamond bar with uh, a low profile endoscopic attachment. So the entire drilling is completed. Any ble venous bleeding is controlled with thromin products. That's the uh, elevation of the anterior cranial, anterior cranial fossa craniotomy bone flap by an endonasal approach. And you can see here clearly the this is the, the pituitary gland, the dura is intact, and uh, these are the optic nerves. And we coagulated the dura. Uh, the tumor here is suckable. So uh, suction or uh, a tumor punch or uh, any kind of uh, QSA also is based upon the consistency of the tumor. And uh, after a good enough decompression, an extra arachnoidal dissection, extra tumoral, uh, the, the arachnoid dissection is done and uh, tumor removal is completed. So once the decompression is adequate and tumor is mobilized, the ACA complex comes into the view and uh, this needs to be meticulously dissected not to cause any damage to the perforators at the, at the ACOM complex. And any, any dense adherences to the, to the vessel, uh, it's better to be, to be coagulated and uh, that part of the tumor can be trimmed. Some, so any injury to the ACA complex vessels, it's difficult to control and can, could end up in, uh, in serious, uh, quite devastating infarcts. So the reconstruction uh, part is done. We standardly follow our two layers, uh, two as inlay, that's Durazin here. We are using the collagen artificial graft and followed by the abdominal fat, fat fascia. And since the tumor is uh, quite significantly big here, we just filled up with some fat as in as just to plug that area. So it becomes three layers in total, followed by overlay of uh, nasoceptal flap here and surgical displays. That's the post-operative CT with the, the drilling defect and complete tumor removal is done. And patient has improvement in the, uh, the both the field defects and uh, even the visual acuity also has improved. That is the three, three, three months post-operative MRI with the flap that's enhancing, which is which means uh, viable. So the complete tumor removal. So the post-operatively we follow up these 
we place 48 hours of uh, lumbar drain and 48 to, 48 to 72 hours of uh, uh, nasal packs, the mirror seal. And uh, our standard, as we said, like two layers of uh, inlay is a standard thing. If there is a lot of uh, big defect and a larger tumor that we remove, we buttress that with, uh, with some fat globules as well with a nasoceptal flap overlay. And initially we were using uh, a thrombin glue, but subsequently we stopped using the, uh, uh, the, the glue products and we're only laying an overlay of flap with uh, two layers inlay, an overlay of uh, nasoceptal flap. And uh, we, we buttress that with the uh, uh, surgical cell. Uh, that's, that's what it's being done. And uh, coming to the another case, uh, this the case demonstrates uh, it's, it's almost by and large the same uh, kind of uh, tumor extensions what we have seen on the first scan. And uh, this patient, we can see clearly the uh, see after the drill, wider spinoidotomy and drilling of the. Uh, anterior case of cranial fossa craniotomy and drilling of the proximal part of the optic nerves. The tumor dissection is uh, done here. Here, the tumor is a little form, so we had to use QSA to decompress that tumor. Fortunately, there are not uh, many additions with the uh, anterior ACOM complex. And here, we can uh, clearly see we can appreciate the superior hypophyseal perforators, uh, which are going and supplying the optic now chiasm, and as well as densely adherent with the tumor, which are being dissected. And on the opposite side, we can see the tumor being densely, uh, densely adherent to the left optic now because the extensions on the optic now are more on the left side. So all these things are possible after a uh, good decompression of the tumor is achieved. Uh, then only we can, we'll be able to appreciate and uh, dissect them nicely. So the same kind of reconstruction is followed here. Then, uh, uh, a layer of uh, duragen, then a facial graft, and you know, then the overlay of the graft and the surgery cell. So this is the post-operative scan showing complete removal. So the patient had uh, right eye temporal field vision, which has uh, right, which, which has resolved, and the left eye, the visual acuity, and the field both have uh, uh, improved significantly. So coming to the another case, uh, the forty-year-old female, which who has a PL negative perception of light, is completely gone in the left eye, and the right eye has uh, a temporal field defect. So. That's her scan, uh, which which shows uh, quite significant extension into the the left uh, optic canal, and the bone is not so much thickened out here. So a wider spinoidotomy has been done after uh, wide spinoidotomy has done after a nasoceptal flap elevation. And uh, that's the cell. We use an angle scope uh, that's 45 degrees uh, here and the same 3 mm diamond bar with, with a low profile endoscopic attachment that's, that's being used. So here the bone is not so much thickened. Uh, so after decompression or the, the, of, of the tuberculum cell, uh, medial optical carotid recess, then a meticulous drilling or the proximal part of the optic canal, that's the, the floor, medial part, and roof of the, the drilled out uh, uh, optic canal has been shown. 
So since the extension was more towards the left side and patient was PL negative, uh, it is utmost important to be thoroughly uh, drilling out the left optic canal. And after the decompression, the dural cut after a vertical midline cut, then a cruciate cut is made and that's extending extended onto the roof of the optic nerve. Going underneath the optic nerve sometimes could be uh, uh, troublesome because the optic artery would be uh, entering the optic canal from the from the carotid into this so as the medial aspect or uh, towards the roof generally the cut is extended out so after uh, decompression the the tumor is uh, being dissected out here and say that that's the chiasm and we can see densely adherent to the to the right optic now and right optic now is so much thinned out that even a slightest of the suction could have just snapped the optic now and uh, we can see it's so densely adherent that it's this there was no point of dissecting that kind of additions and we trimmed it and coagulated it and uh, left it there then uh, did a layer of uh, and the same kind of uh, reconstruction pattern uh, we followed and As the post-operative scan, so the patient has uh, from the patient has from PL negative. She has regained a finger counting at four feet by post-operative by fourth and fifth day. So that is the kind of result that uh, we could achieve by being able to completely decompress the tumor from the optic canal and uh, being able to uh, completely see it. So this is another tumor uh, that we operated, which has extensions onto the carotids. And even in this case, like they are, they are not so much, they are not actually adherent to the carotid. So that's how we are able to, uh, we, we could uh, completely uh, even excise this, uh, this tumor and that's the, the post-operative uh, CT showing that. So coming to the another case, like where this, this is a 50 year old man who is a state road transport corporation driver who had gradual progressive visual loss for one year and had a small tumor on the MRI, uh, which, which with an extension towards the optic nerve. If you love it, the bone, and there's so much hyperostosis uh, out here in the skull base, and the entire, uh, the bone thickness is almost close to a centimeter. But this could have been a relative contraindication, maybe uh, probably had it come to us uh, the very early part of our uh, uh, experience of dealing with these kind of tumors. So here uh, we had to drill out this uh, entire bone, and uh, and gradually, like then the decompression of the optic canal as well was performed, and After the bony drilling, only the left side optic canal and the tumor was decompressed. Tumor was dissected, mobilized, and yeah. 
but uh, completely removed. Patient was PL negative before surgery, and uh, he started counting fingers close to uh, four to six feet, like uh, by uh, month month post operative. So, the, another uh, interesting case uh, that that we did was uh, a sixty five year old man who already lost vision in due to trauma twenty years back. And uh, he had deteriorating vision in the in the other eye for uh, the uh, for since since an year and a half, and he had the scan has uh, demonstrated a huge uh, plantar meningioma, and if you can observe it, like there are ACA vessels completely uh, embedded into the uh, the top of the tumor. As well, this is a non-enhancing tumor, which is uh, a very fibrous one from the from the MRI. And uh, man has only uh, hand movements close to the face. Uh, is the vision left for him? In the, since he already lost the other eye, so this was very crucial for him to be uh, to be to have this uh, the vision in the other eye left. So that is uh, the the complete uh, uh, after uh, removal of the uh, entire tumor. Uh, the the ACA complex and everything can be can be seen very well out here with uh, optic now and uh, the uh, chiasm. So he he completely regained his vision in the uh, in the one eye that he's he's left. So that's the post operative scan uh, CT has. The peculiar thing that happened with this patient was post-operative, we removed his drain by the third day. And uh, after two days, he started becoming getting disoriented. And uh, when the scan was done, it has demonstrated a pneumocephalus. And uh, there was no CSF leak that's happening from the nose. So finally, we could see the entire uh, uh, bed that was wet. That's uh, because of the leakage of the CSF that's happening from the lumbar drain. Uh, that was placed. So the patient had longer, uh, he went into hyponatremia post uh, that CSF leak from the lumbar drain uh, insertion site. And uh, uh, then he, his, his course of hospital course prolonged for uh, two to uh, two weeks uh, post that one, trying to control hyponatremia. And uh, he was all good after that uh, with, uh, with a fully recovered vision in the, in the eye that was left. So this is the last case that uh, I would like to uh, show. Is another uh, female with uh, uh, with large uh, supracellular meningioma, which is uh, quite fibrous and uh, with extensions down into the uh, cella. So the pituitary gland is being uh, dissected from the uh, from the tumor. And it's quite fibrous. So we used QSA for decompressing this tumor. So the scan here looks like as if the, the tumor is overarching onto the, on both the carotids and probably adherent to them. But we can clearly define the plane out here. And you can see, and even these perforators, and that's the pituitary stalk in the background that we can see. Oh, entire tumor and uh, post tumor resection. We can see the entire chiasm, pituitary stalk, and here, since the tumor was very big, we used a uh, few. The globules of the fat initially followed by uh, collagen and since we opened so many cisterns out here uh, the optic and the 
So it's, it's a huge, uh, it's going to be a high flow CSF league without a robust reconstruction. So some fat placement uh, globules followed by you know, then the overlay as a septal flap it's used and uh, buttress that with uh, some more fat out here. So there are different ways uh, we reconstruct it. So what are the ideal cases? Um, the ideal cases are the uh, midline tumors and uh, approximately it's 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 more of uh, a relative uh, uh, figure that we look at like i mean four centimeters but we enlarge the tumors as long as they are in midline without not crossing the nerves not crossing the carotid to the other side are uh, very well can be uh, can be removed and entrapped vessels uh, entrapped vessels either by craniotomy or by uh, by uh, that by endos nasal endoscopic approaches are not something that we can always dissect. It all depends on if the tumor is soft or if the tumor is very firm and completely adherent to the uh, internal carotid artery or any other uh, uh, vascular complex there, that the ACA complex uh, or anything. So it's it's not advisable to be over enthusiastically dissecting and causing a rent in the vessel and ending up. Uh, with, with an infarct is, is not a wiser idea. So any firm additions uh, to the optic uh, nerve or the ICA or ACA complex, it's better to trim them to the minimum possible and uh, leave them or coagulate them and leave them. That That's a wiser uh, thing. And in, uh, in all these cases, like we did uh, now 10 of these tuberculum, uh, the, the planum meningiomas, and uh, the CSF, uh, we had only, uh, we had no CSF leaks from the nose uh, because by now we have done more than 100 uh, cases of uh, various uh, uh, lesions. I mean, throughout the skull base uh, from uh, for reconstructions and removals. You know? So we gained that experience of uh, being able to robustly uh, reconstruct the, uh, the skull base after removal of these tumors. So we had no CSF leaks uh, from the nose. And the lumbar drain side CSF leak in the in in the sixty year old man that uh, I described uh, was uh, there was something that uh, sometimes I mean can pose a challenge. Like and we should be careful when we remove the lumbar drains to make sure that there's no leak from that further. And if at all there's a leak detected, to close it rather than ending up in in trouble uh, post leak with the pneumocephalus and other uh, consequent complications, particularly in the oldest people. And the visual deterioration was uh, there. It's a temporary thing and which happened in one patient where uh, tight packing was done and uh, that was uh, immediately re-explored and uh, that was because of an oversized duragen that we used, uh, the collagen graft uh, that has caused uh, uh, compression over the chiasm. And uh, after uh, reopening and repacking that, uh, the, the patient has... Uh, improved the vision, recovered the vision. And typically most of these deteriorations because of um, uh, extensive overpacking of uh, this, the skull base defect happens by the next day because some of these, uh, the fascia, the collagen grafts that we place, artificial collagen grafts, they swell up and cause compression or the uh, chiasm. So, so what are the advantages that uh, we have with this? Uh, this is a natural corridor. Uh, it's a direct trajectory. And uh, there's less risk of any iatrogenic injury that's being, that would happen to the optic nerve or the optic chiasm while dissecting or uh, mobilizing the tumor. And there's no retraction of the brain. So there's no risk of uh, this very, very minimal uh, risk of seizures compared to any uh, tradi traditional craniotomy where brain retraction is done. And the, the, best, the best part is the the medial optic canal decompression and uh, removal of the entire tumor uh, by carefully dissecting the superior hypophyseal perforators and not damaging them uh, causes the best of the visual outcomes that we have. And uh, in our experience, the traditional craniotomy approaches that we have done have, have never reached this level of visual uh, visual. Uh, improvement outcomes that uh, that that we are we could see in uh, by endonasal endoscopic approaches and uh, the LED vascularization and as well as it which gives a completely uh, 
a devascularized tumor and a second thing like being able to remove the dura underneath and as well as drilling of the entire bone whether it's hyperostosis or involved is something which uh, prevents any long-term recurrences uh, in such kind of tumors as uh, uh, i mentioned uh, the disadvantage is uh, uh, we have to be proficient and uh, there is a little longer learning curve for uh, operating upon these tumors and for all factory grow meningiomas they are very much um, uh, possible but uh, endoscopic endonasal is not an appropriate approach when the patient has a preserved smell because the first thing that we are doing is uh, uh, the drilling of the cribriform plate where we are damaging the olfactory nerves and uh, there should only be and in some of the literature people have attempted when only some decompression was uh, uh, aimed at as part of the uh, treatment uh, particularly in uh, old age patients where uh, the mass effect is a lot. Uh, in such cases, like I mean, olfactory group meningiomas uh, uh, are can be can be done by an endoscopic endoscopy. But in the last five years, we could not find uh, we the olfactory group meningiomas we treated. We all we treated all of them by transcranial because they are either too big to be removed by uh, with, with lateral extensions to be removed by an endonasal approach, or they are uh, small when it preserves smell for the patient. So uh, we we didn't operate any olfactory group meningiomas in those cases. So see, they have, uh, in terms of uh, uh, advantages, the visual outcomes are something which are uh, quite amazing by doing these tumors endonasally. And uh, once you start doing these things, I mean, it's very difficult for to accept to go back and uh, do a transcranial approach for these things. And um, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much. It was uh, indeed very good and I congratulate you for this wonderful series that you have presented. Well, we have Dr. Kabibulo Khasena who is from Tashkent mm -hmm. who recently finished his fellowship mm -hmm. with Professor Tadashi Watanabe. Kabibulo, you were taking notes, I think. <laughs> Would you like to say something? Uh, hi, uh, good evening. It's already night in Japan. I am Dr. Habibullah Hassanov from Uzbekistan. Now I am currently doing my fellowship in uh, endoscopic surgery and uh, Dr. Takwich uh, at Nagoya University Hospital. Uh, during the BOSA lecture, I made uh, some notes for myself and uh, for everyone. So uh, I wanted to do some comments regarding endoscopic endodensal approach <clears throat> in tuberculum cell meningiomas. So as I see, uh, Dr. Uh, Krishna uh, always uh, prefer to use a lumbar drainage after endonasal surgery. And uh, he uses a uh, nasoceptal flap in each case, in every case. So through my uh, almost one year experience at Nagoya University Hospital, I can say that I observed many cases of endo endoscopic endonasal surgeries. I think uh, it's not available even in my country. We don't do such kind of uh, advanced techniques uh, like a simple endonasal approach. So uh, we have to use uh, dural suturing is a uh, dural packing, not always a packing, just suturing the dura with a uh, fat or with a uh, dura gin or uh, fat uh, of um, abdominal rectus muscle. In this case, uh, we don't need to use a uh, nasoceptal flap and other overpacking. Just uh, if patient is uh, a younger, uh, due to uh, prevent uh, adherence of uh, tissues, like uh, we have to use a uh, duragen because it causes less adhesion, adhesions. So after that, maybe we uh, use in uh, case of a lower rate of intraoperative CSF. We can search a uh, dura with a dura gen or fat. If when we have a, a higher and grade three case, grade three CSF intraoperative, we can uh, get uh, abdominal rectus muscle uh, fat here and search it. It requires about uh, uh, 15 or 16 uh, needle, uh, just a continuous suturing in both sides, uh, on starting from the on the top. We search the right side and the left side. In this, uh, at the end, we make a single note and cut. So, uh, in experience, ha experience it had, it requires about uh, 20 or 30 minutes to do suturing. 
in this case, uh, we don't need it to use uh, lumbar drainage as well. So we don't need it to use uh, nasoceptal flap as well. So in uh, in this experience, I I served only the, in a few cases. Uh, I think uh, almost ninety percent in ninety percent case, we don't need to use a nasoceptal flap, which uh, decreases complication related to that procedures. So uh, we use only uh, nasoceptal flap when we know exactly now that uh, postoperative we need to use uh, radio surgery, uh, radiation. Uh, so in this case, we use a uh, nasoceptal flap. And other case, I think uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Krishna for a wonderful presentation. So it was a good experience for me as well as a learner. So we have to use such a kind of improvements in our country. And I, I want to use it after my arrival. Uh, so thank you for one more time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. So uh, that's that's a wonderful suggestion. Like uh, I have seen uh, people using the fascia and uh, and stitching. Like I guess the the instruments and other things that are used, uh, there are different set of uh, special instrument designed as well to improve the ease of suturing uh, the skull base dura after these endonasal endoscopic approaches. And um, as of now, I mean we don't have any specific thing. So. Uh, Probably, I mean, we'll try to incorporate that uh, in in future uh, 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 cases. Like, I mean, we will we'll probably try to work upon it. Yeah. The, as far as uh, the to kind of even uh, to be able to discharge the patients much faster uh, because you don't need lumbar drain as you suggested. Like, thank you, thank you for that suggestion. Thank, thank you. Thank you. One one thing that I would like to mention to Kabibullo is that this closure is a is a matter of uh, regional and personal choices. I would say this endoscopic suturing is a, a favorite thing in Japan. I've seen their specialized note pushers and all. Over the years, they have uh, improvised in their instruments. And I've seen Professor Tadashi Watanabe operating. There are at least six boxes huge boxes where there is only left-handed instruments, one side is right-handed instruments. Actually, this specialized instruments and expertise is largely not available in low and middle income countries. So it's largely a matter of choice and uh, of a reasonable variability of closure. So thank you very much. And uh, we had a wonderful session. And I would like to thank uh, all the panelists and our honorable speaker, uh, Dr. Yaram Nini, to join us. Uh, with this, I would like to inform that this was the last webinar of the year 2022. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Kasper Oslens and Professor Vamsi Krishna Yaram Nini, as well as the Chair, Professor Kentro Mori, for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. A huge thanks to our uh, uh, mentor and Vice President of ACNS, Professor Shubin, for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. I, as I mentioned earlier, we have around 370 people who have logged in from around the world for today's webinar. A special thanks to my co-host, Dr. Lyubun Singh, for joining me today. So until we all meet again, on the 7th of January, it is bye-bye from all of us. Wish you all a very, very happy new year. And thank you very much for all your support that you have shown us for the ACNS webinars over the last two years. Bye-bye.